open up your Bibles. Uh, we're going to read through the entire book of Leviticus and discuss Hebrew purity ethics. I'm just kidding. You guys never, the 11:15 service never laughs at my jokes. And I have a lot of them, so you better start responding. I'm not going to stop telling them. My name is John McCambridge. For those of you who don't know me, uh, if I've never introduced myself to you, if I've never met you, uh, this is one of the greatest privileges that I have to be able to stand up here and to speak and to uh, share my experience with God, to share my walk with God, to share my relationship with Jesus, and to just discuss all the ways that I'm kind of fumbling and bumbling through this life like everybody else in here. And so uh, thank you guys for being here and thank you for giving me this opportunity in order for this to be what I would consider an honest exchange. Um, in order for me to be honest up here, sometimes that means that the person standing here has to be vulnerable about things in their life that maybe they're not proud of, maybe things in their life that they wish weren't true or things that you know, bring them some shame. And so today, I wanna share something with you. And this is actually something that was amazing because I literally woke up one day and was like, how is this the way that I am? How did this happen? Like, how am I this person? And the thing that I wanna talk to you about that sent my life into a tailspin is that I don't know how anything works. I don't know how anything works. Have you ever had this like moment? I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and I was like, I don't know how any of this is happening. Like, I don't know how this is working. All of these things I use on a daily basis that, that I don't know how my life would work without them. And I don't know the first thing about how they actually work or what is going on while I'm using them. And this is unsettling. And I'll explain to you why. Okay, I'll give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Cars. I don't know how cars work. Some people know how cars work, I don't. And so to me, how a car works is that you get in the front seat and you turn the ignition and gasoline goes into the engine and there's combustion and then you press this pedal to go and you press this pedal to stop and you steer like this. And I steer like this because I'm swaggy, but that's like neither here nor there. I drive this car 20 miles to work every day and I drive it 20 miles home and I have no idea what's happening the whole time I'm doing it. That's unsettling. That's like something you don't think about, but when you do, it kind of freaks you out a little bit. Planes are magic, I think. I don't know how planes work. You know, you have four tons of metal, 30,000 feet in the air, and it flies 600 miles an hour literally wherever you want it to go. That's magic. That's magic. And people who know planes are like, no, it's not magic. It's, you know, aerodynamics and jet propulsion. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't know what those words mean. That, that means nothing to me. And so I don't understand cars. Planes are magic, which, you know, is a frustrating thing to feel. At my old job, I used to go to Detroit and we would fly to Shanghai or Hong Kong up over the ice caps in a plane every other month. And the whole time you're like, I don't understand what's happening right now. That's unsettling. You have to watch movies the whole time so you don't have a panic attack. It's, it's wild, it's wild, okay? Uh, batteries, what are batteries? I'm serious. I think one of the great mysteries of the human life is that we walk around all day and pretend like we know what batteries are or what they do. I have no idea. Someone's like, there's acid in them and there's a positive charge and a negative charge. And I'm like, okay, I guess we got to change them. They're bad or something. I, I don't know. And, and this is what I do. When, when I don't understand something, I project it onto everybody else and pretend like nobody understands it. And in the office this week, <laughs> people were like, you know, I very specifically understand how batteries work. <laughs> and I was like, we got Albert Einstein over here who knows how batteries work. That's impressive. <laughs> Congratulations. And you know, then that got me thinking a little bit. It's like E equals MC squared. What's that? What does that mean? It's the theory of relativity. I think that's how all of this is happening right now. And if someone came up to me tomorrow and was like, hey, uh, actually E equals MC cubed, I'd be like, okay. Because I don't know what that means. I don't know why that matters. It means nothing to me. Kimchi, are you aware of this? What the heck is that stuff? It's like fermented and it's spicy and it cures you of all of your ailments. And I was like, I don't know. What, someone told me it's cabbage. And I was like, it's not cabbage, but it might be cabbage. I, I really have no idea. And so my life started spiraling out of control because I didn't know what anything was. And because I'm in, uh, and really what I was saying and what I found is that we have all these things in our life that we understand what they do, or we understand what they are. And then you peel back one layer of truth and ask that daunting question, what does that mean? And now you're back in the dark, or at least back in the fog. And you don't really know how these things are working. And that was scary to me. And being in this world, in ministry, in the church, I think uh, one of my greatest convictions, one of the things I have the most passion about is I think that a lot of Christians walk through their Christian life in this darkness or in this fog. 
Here's what I mean. I think that we give our lives to Jesus. I think that we, we claim him as our savior, as our God. And then it's like, what does that mean? What do I do now? What do I do now? Does that mean I have to clean up my life? Like, is it behavioral? Does it mean that now I have to stop doing these activities and start doing these activities? What does that actually mean to give your life to Jesus? How are we supposed to live? What does that mean in our faith? And in order to soothe my soul and ease my conscience, conscience, I decided that I would try to figure out at least one thing uh, that was important to the sustaining of life and figure out how it worked. Because here's the, here's the deal. If batteries confuse me, there are things in this world that are unfathomable to me. Like, what about organic life? How, how is this happening right now? How am I moving my arms? I don't know. What about ecosystems? If all the bees die, then we all die. Why? I, is it pollination? I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. And so I wanted to figure out something that sustained life, something that was essential to life, and I was gonna figure out why it worked. I was gonna peel back one layer, and I was gonna figure it out. And so I decided to look into water, because water is the essence of life, right? But what does that mean? What does that mean? And so I went on a 48-hour, what I would consider doctoral levels of research deep into the bowels of Google and Wikipedia, and I am going to explain to this community today how water works and why plants need water. Now I understand that I probably have a depth of knowledge about this that most people in this room don't have. And so I have some diagrams and I'll talk slowly and I'll use layman's terms, okay? This is a plant. Are you guys tracking? Is everybody still with me? The plant is in dirt that we in the science community call soil, okay? And so here's what you have to do. You gotta pour water, which comes in one of these things, I guess, <laughs> into the soil. And this is important, it has to be water, okay? It has to be water, it can't be Gatorade or something like that. My sister poured Gatorade in her plants in college and they all died very quickly <laughs> because he doesn't need Gatorade or electrolytes, it needs water, so you gotta use water and you put the water in the plant and then here's where it gets interesting, okay? The water gets absorbed up through the root system of the plant, into the stem, through the capillaries, and the first thing that water does that I didn't know is that it actually provides the structure of the plant. And so a healthy leaf looks like it does and feels like it does because there's water pressure on it. And so when a plant gets dehydrated and there's no water there, it wilts because there's nothing pushing. I didn't know that, I thought that was interesting. And the second thing it does is, and this is the most important thing, so, so this, is, this is really key. All of the chemical reactions that take place in this plant that lead to it continuing to live happen only in the context of water. It's the medium through which all of these reactions take place. Nothing can happen that sustains this plant's life without water. And all of these chemical reactions ha actually happen at night and so in the morning, you know, like, like an example of this would be photosynthesis, right? The way that it turns sunlight into energy or something. And so that happens in water. And at night, after you're done, it transpires through the leaves. And that's why there's dew in the morning. You should clap for that. That's amazing. Who knew that? I didn't know that. That's why there's dew. And so interesting, right? So that's how plants work. Human bodies are much more complex than that. And they use water for a lot of different things. Water regulates the temperature of the body. It provides moisture to tissue like your eyes. And so if you get dehydrated, your eyes get scratchy and your vision can get blurry. Um, uh, you know, like you produce saliva and without water, you have the inability to produce saliva, which means you can't really digest or ingest your food very well. It protects your vital organs. And again, the most important thing it does is that it provides the medium through which all of these chemical reactions take place. And so it takes nutrients and minerals and it dissolves them and takes them to cells and takes them to organs. And it's really interesting. And as I was looking at this, I was thinking that, you know, the interesting thing is that from the beginning of time, before science was even available, to understand this, people knew that they needed water, didn't they? People understood the importance of water. And I think that two of the main reasons people have always understood why we need water or the fact that we need water uh, is the first is thirst, right? We get thirsty. We get thirsty. If you don't have enough water in your body, it sends a signal and your body is dramatic. 
And so what your body is telling you is that if you don't go get water, you are going to die. <laughs> and that's, that is literally what thirst is, which I think is interesting. And so from the beginning of time, humans have thirsted and have been seeking water in order to quench their thirst. The second way is observation. Right, and if you were an ancient people and you're walking around, you go up to a riverbank and it's green and it's lush and there's life and there's plants and there's animals. And then you go four miles into the desert and it's desolate and there is no life. Why? Because there's water over here. And so through thirst and observation, we have always understood as people, as humans, that where there is water, there is life, okay? And this is underlined because this is in the notes that are on your clipboard. So you guys can follow along if you want. Where there is water, there is life, and where there is no water, there is no life, okay? So from the beginning of time, the understanding is that where there is water, there's life. Where there is no water, there is no life. And about 6,000, 8,000 years ago, an ancient people group came along that was revolutionary in a lot of ways. And one of the ways that they were revolutionary is the way in which they worshiped their God. See, they believed that there was only one God. And all these other societies and all these other people and all these other religions believe that there were all kinds of gods for everything specific. And this group of people that we will call the Israelites or the Hebrew people or the Jews came along and they believed in one God, his name is Yahweh. And this is the God that we still worship today. And they believe that this God was the creator and sustainer of all life. And that includes all of these elements that lead to life like water. And so water was a part of how they worshiped their God and it was a part of what they thanked their God for. And actually water was particularly important to, to the Israelites uh, because they lived in like deep community, deep communion with the earth. They were like environmental, I'm just kidding, it's because they lived in the desert. They lived in the desert. I mean, have you ever, if you've ever been to the Middle East, you understand this. Um, I spent a little bit of time there at my old job in, in the, uh, like Abu Dhabi and Dubai. And you're like, how is there a metropolis here in the middle of a desert? And the answer is that there's massive amounts of technology that have been able to take water from where it is to where it isn't. But back when they didn't have it, it was important to find water. They lived in a desert. And so the Israelites uh, worshiped their God for water. They thanked him for it. They asked him for it. And they actually compared him to water because water sustains life and they believe that their God sustained life. And they believe that spiritually speaking, they needed God the same way that physically we need water. So they called him the living water. And the cool thing about these people, I think it's the coolest thing about them, honestly, and I think we can learn a thing or two, is that one of the ways they went about worshiping their God is that they threw giant parties. They threw huge parties. I mean, they had six giant festivals that was mandatory for you to go to as a Jew. And you went and you worshiped and partied and feasted and drank wine and praised your God because your God is great. And so it's this really beautiful thing that, that these people had. And what is considered the grandest of all feasts is called the Feast of the Tabernacles or the Feast of the Booths. And the reason it's called the Feast of the Tabernacles or the Feast of the Booths is because people would come in from all over the Near East, all of these Jews from all over the place would come into the holy city of Jerusalem where the temple was and they would dwell in tabernacles, which just means tent. So people would come and they would just dwell in tents. And so it's called the festival of the tabernacles. And I guess booth is another word for tent. I don't know why. And so the feast of the tabernacles was the biggest celebration of the year. It was the last festival on the calendar. It was in late September. And so what that means is that it was right after harvest. So they harvested their wheat and their barley and their grapes and their olives. And then they had this festival and then the winter was the rainy season. So it's just after harvest, going into the rainy season, what do you think the main object of this festival was? What do you think this festival centered around? Water, it centered around water. And so they would teach about water, they would praise God for water, they would thank him for the water that provided this harvest and ask him for water so that they didn't starve to death next harvest and they equated him as the living water that their souls needed. And so this is what the Festival of the Tabernacles was. This is what this party was all about. And in about AD 32, there's this chronicling in the book of John of the Festival of the Tabernacles, this giant feast where they're celebrating water and God. And there's one question that everybody keeps asking. There's one question that everybody wants to know. Everybody's on the edge of their seat and they wanna know, where is he? Is he coming? 
Read this in, in John chapter seven, verses 11 through 13. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him amongst the people. While some said he is a good man, others said, no, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. Who are we talking about? Jesus. They're talking about Jesus. Jesus was this revolutionary rabbi, this teacher who had been touring the north of Jerusalem for, for two years. And he'd been preaching this revolutionary message. It was revolutionary socially and politically and religiously. And he was telling the people that God was doing something new. He was telling the people that he was the messenger bringing this good news. He was telling the people that he had the authority of God, authority that their religious leaders didn't have. He was telling people that he was the Messiah, the one that they had been waiting for for thousands of years. Revolutionary message. Revolutionary message. What happens when you preach a revolutionary message? Two things. Some people follow you and believe you, and some people don't believe you, and they try to kill you. That's what revolutionary means. You're trying to overturn something. And so Jesus had kind of created these two groups of people. Some of them wanted him dead. Some of, some of them believed him and followed him. But amongst the people who wanted him dead were the religious leaders. And they ran these festivals. They ran these temples. And so the people were like, is he going to show up here in front of these people? That would take some fortitude. Is he going to show up? And so they want to know, and they're muttering. Where is he? And he does show up. He does show up. And one of the, the images we have to get out of our head is Jesus as this like peaceful, you know, walking around very meek and timid. Sometimes he was, but sometimes he was brash. And sometimes he said it with his chest. And, and in this moment, he walks into the temple with his posse, which is a Greek word that actually means group. And so it really is his posse. He walks into the temple and he sets up and he starts teaching next to the rabbis, next to the teachers, next to the people who want him dead. And what is he saying? The exact same things that got him in that position in the first place. I have the authority of God. I am equal to God. I was sent by God. Crazy claims. And so the tension starts to rise through the week. And then there's violence in the air. And his disciples are like, I don't know if we're going to get out of here alive. I am going to die in front of my people, in my temple, and I'm gonna get killed by my religious leaders. What a way to go. What a way to go. And so they're wondering, how are we gonna make it through this? And so we get to the last day and the disciples probably take a deep breath and say, thank goodness, we gotta get through this one last ceremony and then we get to leave here, hopefully with our lives. And the last ceremony of, the, of this time is called the water libation ceremony. And this is really cool. Remember, we're celebrating water. We're celebrating God for giving us water. We're asking him to give us more physical water. And we're comparing Yahweh, God, to water for our souls that we need. And so this last uh, symbolic celebration, all of the high priests and the leaders of the faith go down to the river and they fill up cisterns of living water. This river is literally the reason why there's a civilization here. And so they fill up cisterns of water and they come back into the temple and they all start to pour it into the altar. And the water starts to rise in the altar and everybody starts to get a little excited and the volume starts to rise and people start jumping around a little bit, chanting, they're excited, they're expressive people. They're getting excited and then the, the, the water starts to overflow out of the altar and everybody starts jumping around and dancing and yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna which Kevin explained earlier, Hosanna, Hosanna, God save us, God save us. God save us by giving us living water that we can physically live and God save us by giving us your presence to clench, to quench our souls and our spirit and our longing. Hosanna, Hosanna, God save us, God save us. The water's overflowing from the altar and Jesus stands up and he cries out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I mean the drama, the theatrics. You should read this book. You should read this book. It's captivating. It's compelling. 
It's revolutionary, it's subversive, it's controversial. The person of Jesus is captivating. Look at what he just did. And you're not allowed to do that. You can't do that. You can't walk into your biggest festival of the year, a festival that's celebrating water, a festival that's equating God with water. You can't walk in at the climax of the festival and the celebration and say, it's me. I'm the living water. You can't do that. You can't call yourself God. It's not allowed. It's called heresy. It's called blasphemy. And so in this moment, Jesus signs his death warrant and the rest of his ministry, he is walking around a dead man, dead man walking. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the high priests and the Sadducees, all these words that just describe powerful people in the faith want him dead. What an amazing story. What an amazing bold proclamation that Jesus makes in danger to himself. And boom, we flash to the next scene. The next scene after this festival, probably the day after, and Jesus is teaching outside the temple, and this is the first attempt that's made on his life. And look at what they do. The scribes and the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders, brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst. And they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? And they asked him this, so that they might have some charge to bring against them. And so here's a little bit of the backstory. If he says, yeah, go ahead and stone her, there's two problems, right? Number one, uh, kind of goes against this whole grace message that he's been preaching, his whole ministry, that's a little problematic. And then number two, legally, uh, the, the Jewish people and Jerusalem was a province of Rome. And only the Roman government can carry out capital punishment. So if he says, yeah, stone her, then maybe he becomes an enemy of the state and they can deal with him, right? And so here we are. When you read this verse, you should ask yourself a couple questions. A couple alarms should be going off in your mind. The first one, how do you catch a woman in adultery? That seems like a little bit of an odd thing to write down and not describe or give any like background. How do you catch a woman in adultery? And second of all, you should ask, is it really true in the law of Moses that if a woman is caught as a prostitute or as an adulteress, uh, we throw rocks at her until she dies? Is that, really what, is that really the law? And so let me back up for a second. Rem- remember where we were, right? Festival of the tabernacles, everyone comes in, everyone's dwelling in tents and they're feasting and they're dancing and they're praising and they're drinking wine. And what happens when adults go camping sometimes and drink too much wine? People end up in each other's tents. And so this is a tale that transcends time and culture. And so maybe that's how she got caught, right? Maybe that's what's going on here. Where's the man? Because the law of Moses says that both parties should be stoned in a case such as this. So where's the man? There's a couple theories. One of the theories is that he's one of the religious leaders, right? He's not here because he's there. Maybe that's true. Or maybe there's a woman who's being used as a means to an end in a misogynistic society, right? I mean, that would be hard for us to imagine, but maybe that's the case. Maybe that's it. Another tale that transcends time and culture. And so here's the scene. There's a woman, naked and ashamed and caught and vulnerable with a death sentence, and she's guilty. And she's at the feet of Jesus. What's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? Because if he goes against the law of Moses, you see, this is a problem. We think the law of Moses is just some like really strict morality thing, but it's not. It was literally what marked these people as God's people. He gave them this law and said, uh, you are my people and I am your God. This is how you will act. And so it was identity. This wasn't like, oh, I'm trying to do the right thing. It was identity. So could he really go against Moses? Is he really going to kill this woman? What's he going to do? And because he's Jesus and he's kind of a baller, he does something different. He, he just bends down. He starts drawing in the dirt. Whoop. What's he doing? What's he writing? A lot of people think it's scripture, right? Some scripture that's maybe condemning to the Pharisees. It probably was. Some people think that he's just drawing in the dirt to, di- or, uh, to divert eyes away from this, this, this woman who's naked and on the ground vulnerable. Either way, Jesus is just doodling in the dirt. And they're asking him, teacher, what should we do? What should we do? What should we do? 
And finally, after they continue to ask him, he stands up and he says, let him who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he goes back and starts drawing in the dirt again. It was really funny. It's kind of amazing. And when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, because the longer you live, the more impossible that statement is to stand up under. And Jesus was left alone with the woman. And I told you he was dramatic. Look at what he does. He stands up, he's like, oh, oh where'd, they, where'd they go? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she's like, no one, Lord. And he said, then neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. And so this story is so profound and so deep and so layered with meaning that we like have to get to the bottom of this. Here's a woman and she is dead to rights at the mercy of forces who do not care about her. She's guilty. Not only is she accused, she's guilty and she's here. And Jesus moves into her space, he saves her, he forgives her and he sends her away new. It's profound, that's deep. And our problem sometimes as Christians is that we think that Jesus was a moralist. We think that what he was doing here was walking around and giving moral lessons, saying this is actually how you should act and behave. Like he walks into a group of people and he's like, gather around, gather around. Um, you thought that you were supposed to be mean, but actually, you were supposed to be nice. And everybody cheers, and that was like some huge thing. That's not what he was doing. That's not who he was. That's not the message that he came with. And so we look at this message because we think it's all about this moral code that he's bringing, and we think this story is about judgment. Don't judge, right? Don't judge because there's stuff wrong with you. If you judge people, they could also judge you, and God could judge us all. So what are we doing walking around judging everybody all the time? And that's not untrue. That is part of the story. Part of Jesus' message was grace and mercy and compassion and empathy. But if that's what you take away from this, you're missing something huge. You're missing something huge. Remember where he just was. Remember what he was just doing, right? Remember what he said that made them want to kill him in the first place. What did he say? He said, I am the living water. He's showing us what it looks like to be living water. This is the next scene. He's showing us what it looks like to be living water. You see in the temple, what he's saying is that if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And here's a woman who is thirsting, okay? Thirst is a precursor of death. You thirst because you're gonna die if you don't satisfy that. And so this woman is dead, she's dying. And Jesus moves into this space and he heals her and he forgives her and he sends her away new. Now, some people in this room have already come to this conclusion and, and this is so beautiful. This is why Michael Crest got baptized this morning. The reality of this story is that you are the woman. You're the woman. You are not the Pharisees who are a little too judgmental. You are not Jesus who saves the day. And you are not the disciples who are innocent bystanders. You are the woman. I am that woman. Michael Kress went under the water this morning as that woman, broken and hurt and vulnerable and helpless and guilty. This is the miracle of our faith. This is the miracle of grace that God meets us where we are in our vulnerability in our brokenness, in our frustration, in the fact that we're turned in on ourselves and selfish, and he pours out his restoring and redemptive and saving love with no strings attached. We are the woman, and Jesus brings us to life. That's the first thing in this story. N.T. Wright, who's a theologian, puts it like this. He calls to his followers who have no life in themselves and they come to life with him. That's the Christian story. We go to Jesus and we drink. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And here's what happens. This is the tragedy, is that you embrace this most beautiful story. You embrace this story that's hard to put into words, it's so beautiful. 
It's so flowery, it's so lovely. And then we stop. We don't know what else to do. We stop here. Most Christians stop here. We have to remember what Jesus said when he made that statement. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and your thirst will be quenched. It's not what he said. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and you will be filled with water. It's not what he said. Listen to what he says, because this is amazing. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You have to understand the gravity of this statement, that we show up thirsty and we leave a river. That's our faith. That's, who we are. That's the power of God, and this is our calling. We are to be rivers of living water, rivers. And my conviction is that most Christians think that we're supposed to be lakes, right? We think we're supposed to be lakes. Lakes are beautiful. They're beautiful to look at. People vacation on lakes. They're pristine. Everyone goes and admires how lovely and beautiful a lake is. And so we give our lives to Christ, and then we start to just try to clean up our act, change our behaviors, don't do this anymore, abstain from this, move away from this, keep doing this, because everybody needs to look at my life and understand how beautiful it is and how holy it is. Lakes are beautiful to look at. The problem is that lakes are stagnant. Lakes are stagnant. They just sit there. Lakes aren't moving through the wilderness bringing life to these areas where otherwise there would be death. Lakes are stagnant. And the one thing about the teachings of Jesus that you cannot get away from, the one thing that will wrestle your heart to the ground, the thing that will make you squirm, is that Jesus says over and over again that you cannot be stagnant. You cannot be stagnant, you cannot be passive, we cannot be cultural Christians. We have to move, and rivers move. Rivers of living water. Think about what a river is. It's moving through the wilderness. All these places where there is no life except where that water passes through, there's life springs up all around it. That's what the Christian life is. That's what the Christian mission is. That is the next step after you give your life to Jesus. That's the point of our faith. Now, where are we supposed to move towards? Where are we supposed to move? If we can't be stagnant, we must move. Where do we move? Well, let's go back to the woman at his feet. What does she represent? Because we were saying that she represented us, which is true. But if we do a little bit of a more like politically incorrect analysis, she's a mess. The woman's a mess. I mean, she's sinful, she's guilty, she's caught, she's ashamed, she's helpless. She's a mess. And Jesus moves into her space and restores her and sends her away. And so the Christian faith, the Christian mission, those of you who are in the room who consider yourself Christ followers, the mission is to move like rivers toward the messes. Move toward the messes. There are people in this room today who doubt Christianity, who doubt the person of Jesus, and one of the reasons that they do is because they've been around Christians all their lives who are stagnant lakes. Maybe never met a Christian who's not. And this is not something that we can do. We have to be people who engage culture, who engage the world, who don't set ourselves apart from it, but move into it and bring life because there is healing to be had. And water heals and water transforms and it restores, and it leads to growth. And have you ever thought about this? Water creates futures. It creates the future for everything it touches. This plant, this animal, this tribe or civilization, everything depends in its future on whether or not it gets this water. Water creates future. Water is essential. And I believe that Christians, Christ followers, who are willing to go engage culture, to move into these spaces where there is death and bring life in their wake are essential to this world. And so our calling is to live like water, 
to live like water in all parts of our lives, in your families, in your workplace, and in your communities. We should live like water. The things we pass, the things we make contact with, life happens in our wake. Hope, forgiveness, restoration, that's what we're supposed to be. That's who we are called to be. Life givers, living water, rivers. In my own life, in my own family, you have to understand this about me, my family uh, is the thing in this world that I'm most proud of. I love my family so much, but my family is not perfect. And over the last 20 years, people have made decisions, including myself, man, that you can't walk back from. People have done things to each other in my family that we don't get to, to, to walk away from. Decisions have been made, wounds have been opened that are really hard to close. And when that stuff happens, which it happens in every family, the moisture starts to get sucked out of the environment. And all of a sudden, the environment is ripe for death, death of relationship, death of love, death of hope, death of closeness. And the reason that I stand here today with a great relationship with my family is because my oldest sister, Carrie, for as long as I can remember, from a time that she was way too young to have this responsibility, has been the living water to my family. She's moved into my family, into these spaces where death has started to come up, and she's provided living water. She's, she's forced conversation. She's forced confrontation. She's been intentional. She has grabbed members of my family like me who are trying to run away from it who don't want a part of that. I don't want to be in that. And she grabs us and she moves us back in. She acts like water. And what happens when water passes through a place where there's death? Life happens. And my family has a living, breathing, beautiful love amongst all of our siblings, my mom, my dad, my sisters, my brother, all of us, because my sister Carrie is living water. It works. We have people in this community who go into prisons and give the gospel and build relationships. Prisons are a system that is purposely designed to destroy life. It's what they are. It's not for restoration, it's for punishment. And we have people who move into those spaces, into that mess, and they give the gospel and they build relationships. And guess what happens when they leave? Life. Life happens. Hope pops up. Love sprouts, it works. We have small group leaders here, man. When you sign up to lead a small group, you are running full speed into 16 messes that all come together to provide one big giant mess. And what happens in those small groups? Life happens. People come back to life. People have hope. People know they're loved. This is our calling. We have to be people who stop thinking our faith is about saying a prayer and going to heaven when we die. That's not who we are. That's not what this is. In the same way that I understood what a car does, but I have no idea how it works, this is how our faith works. Where there is water, there is life, and where there is no water, there is no life. And I was reflecting on how stupid I sound earlier when I was talking about batteries. Listen, I might not know how cars work, and I might not know how planes work, and I might not know how batteries work, and I don't always do this. Trust me, that has to be the, the first thing that you understand about whoever stands up here and speaks. I don't do this all the time. I'm not good at this all the time. But I know this. I know that this is true. I know that this is our faith. I know this is who we're supposed to be. And I know that this is what the world needs. And this is the movement that 514 is supposed to be. This is who we're supposed to be. This is what we are doing in the world. This is why we are building a building. This is why we want people to come in these doors. This is why we have small groups. This is why we're in the community. Because we're living water. And everything we touch should turn to life. And so I want this community to, to, to reflect on this in your own personal life and understand what is happening to the people in your life that you touch. Are they coming to life? Are people coming to life where you are? Are you meeting people in those dark spaces and bringing life like a river that's flowing through the wilderness? It's quite a call. 
It's demanding. It's scary. And we should pray about it. We should pray about it. I'm gonna say a prayer. I'm gonna close us. And then Carmen's gonna come up and she has a couple announcements for you. Thank you guys for being this community. Thank you for being the people that you are. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us the amazing privilege of being your living water here on the earth, in your creation. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to move into spaces where there is no life and bring you to people and bring hope to people and bring love to people. I pray for the boldness of this community. I pray for our willingness to be uncomfortable, to move into these spaces that we try to run away from. I pray that we recognize that not only did you die to forgive us of our sins, but you rose from the dead so that we can live. Thank you for being who you are and thank you for this community. In your name we pray, amen.